they found a saber tooth kitten. So this paper crossed my feed today, and it's a baby saber tooth cat mommy found in Siberia with intact skin, fur, and toes. Um, we'll get into the actual paper a little bit, but this CNN Science article really covers it pretty well. So they found a mummified saber tooth kitten in Siberia, but it's extremely well preserved. Uh, they have this figure here. So on the top is the saber tooth kitten that they found. So the, uh, the, the mummified one, they estimate that it's sort of just a few weeks old. And down below, this is actually a modern lion, a uh, African lion that we're used to seeing um, that is of a similar age. So this one's three weeks old. And we can tell that they are very, very similar. Uh, these weren't found together. This is just showing uh, how well preserved the saber tooth kitten was uh, compared to a, a living species. This is crazy. So we'll cover in this video sort of what the paper looked at, what they found, and also kind of what it means for each of these components. With papers like this that uncover a new fossil or a new specimen of some type, they do tend to go into excruciating detail. That's just the nature of these types of publications. Um, down below, I have it highlighted where they measured, you know, every individual tooth. Um, so papers like this are very dense for that reason. So I'm just going to cover the big, uh, the big so what's of this. We've, of course, found specimens of saber-toothed cats before. Um, in this one, the, the Latin is homotherium latidens. But the difference with this is just how much fur we have. Uh, so you can see in this figure, this is an actual image of the frozen mummy uh, specimen. But then on the uh, B, the to the right, is the CT scan. Uh, most specimens nowadays that are extremely novel will get CT scanned. Um, this just allows us to see, I believe there's a better image. Yeah, it allows us to really see the individual components of the specimen. Uh, at, at excruciating detail. And also, this is a now in a digital format that we could reasonably send to another scientist, right? That, that's a big deal. Uh, this isn't some specimen that's locked away at some museum in a different country that is difficult to access. Uh, now we have just this data that is able to be sent around the world much easier. So with this study, they carried out some radiocarbon dating, and they put this specimen at around 32,000 years old. If you're new to carbon dating, let's give a very, very quick overview. So um, free floating in the atmosphere are different isotopes of of carbon. And in this case, we are interested in uh, carbon-14, C14. This is a radioactive isotope that all living creatures absorb while they are living. So say we have our saber-tooth cat here. Uh, let's draw a little saber-tooth kitten. Ooh, big old teeth. Um, while this kitten is living, carbon-14 is being constantly absorbed into this individual. But once the individual dies, carbon-14 is no longer sequestered. You can really get into the, uh, to the literature on this. It's, um, it's because it's uptaken by plants, and then the plants are then eaten by organisms that are then eaten by the saber-toothed cat. So that is how it gets its carbon-14, blah, 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 blah. But the important thing to know is that this carbon-14, once the animal dies, it starts to break down. Remember, this is a radioactive isotope, and so it has a concept known as a half-life. Let's look at an example of this half-life. Say we have one kilogram of C14. That's a huge amount of carbon-14. Uh, remember, carbon-14 is radioactive. So what happens is that it decays over time, and that amount of time it takes to decay by half is called its half-life. So, in other words, we can tell how long something is based on how long it takes to get from one kilogram of carbon-14 to maybe half a kilogram of carbon-14. Uh, and then that will also decay by half, again, to say 0.25 kilograms 
And then again, we can go, you know, keep going on 0.125 kg, et cetera, et cetera, going on down the chain. But what matters is that this half-life, I'll just abbreviate it HL, for each of these time steps is the same. So even though it's decaying by one kilogram to uh, half a kilogram, the other half a kilogram is becoming nitrogen, for, uh, by the way. Uh, but every time it decays by half, uh, we have one half-life. And in the case of carbon-14, we know the half-life is roughly 5,300 years. Um, so by using this metric, we can actually estimate just how long something is based on the decaying of carbon-14 into uh, other, other atoms. Right. So this is a very, very quick overview of what carbon dating actually is. You'll see this very, very often in the literature, particularly with fossil studies such as this. Now, most of the time when we're working with fossils, we only have the bones, but that can still be incredibly useful. Structures such as the skull can actually tell us a lot about an organism, since after all, skulls are highly specialized structures classic example for how a skull will tell us something about the muscle structure of an organism. This is a sagittal crest. This is found on many different organisms, and it is a point on the top of the skull, a ridge on the top of the skull that muscles can attach to, and it is most often associated with a very strong bite force. These are the muscles that pull down to make the jaws actually clench together, right? Um, so we can tell, based on this saber-toothed kitten, uh, that it doesn't have this sagittal crest here, right? So that's one potential thing that we could tell is that, hey, it doesn't have the sagittal crest. Maybe it didn't have a super strong bite force, even though they're known for their teeth. Of course, this needs to be compared to an adult specimen. I to do my due diligence here, and I looked up the skull of the Smilodon, of a, of a saber-toothed cat's. And you can actually tell that they don't have that strong of a sagittal crest. Um, it's very, very minor. But then I decided to look up, do we know the bite force of it? And we actually do. So this is what's fascinating. The bite force of a saber-toothed cat is about a third that of lions. So remember, what did we say? The skull tells us about the musculature of the organism. This is a lion skull. We can actually see a somewhat pronounced sagittal crest here on the right, and we can also see how the muscles are attached on the sagittal crest. So you can think of these muscles as pulling up the jaw and using that crest as sort of an anchor point, right? It's, it's pulling up the jaws. So there is a really great example for how we can tell that, well, the saber-toothed cats, they don't have this sagittal crest, so perhaps they don't have a strong jaw musculature for clamping down as hard as possible. Um, and that seems to be true with saber-toothed cats. Uh, this picture right here in particular really shows it well. They are more known for opening their jaws at extreme angles, making them more of a precision uh, hunter rather than a, uh, you know, a lion stalking its prey and then clamping down around the prey's neck. So while skulls are incredibly useful, they can't tell us everything. Uh, and that's why these specimens are so important. Uh, let's look at the example of the, the paw here again. So this is, this is similar to the headshot from earlier, where the top is the preserved specimen and then the bottom is the, um, uh, the, the lion, the three-week-old lion, just for comparison's sake, uh, which just to, to really highlight this, the, the top images are from an organism that lived 30,000 years ago, and the bottom is from an organism that lived probably within this decade. So the, the level of preservation is incredible uh, for this specimen. But uh, think of it as the skull and the other bones can tell us maybe how muscles were attached, but when we have the the skin and the, the fur of an animal, we can actually tell how much muscle there was in an area. Uh, even if the muscles have completely degraded or you know turned into mush or just completely are gone and only the skin remains, you can kind of think as the skin is like a bag that is wrapped around the skeleton uh, that we put all of the muscles and organs and, and everything into. So in essence, if a particular area has a larger bag, uh, that means there are more muscles there. There were likely more of whatever uh, was internal in that area.
for this preserved saber tooth cub, they actually looked at the neck area and they were able to provide more evidence that saber tooth cats likely had a much more hypertrophied neck area compared to modern day lions, uh, meaning that there's just more muscles around the neck. Uh, now the exact reasons for why of course are up for debate and there's many reasons uh, that people can create fabulous theories based on why these cats have more muscles there. But what's important is that this specimen, when compared to that, uh, that Leo cub, that, that lion cub, it's able to say, hey, there's more muscles here. And this is really, really important because maybe now this actually tells us something about uh, another species. Remember, these papers are just for this paper. But some other fossil scientists, some other paleontologists may be looking at the saber-toothed cats and say, oh, this actually confirms an idea that I had, but I didn't have the data for it. Um, or maybe someone is trying to reconstruct the lineages of the big cats and they need to look back in time. This information may be extremely useful for teasing apart the differences between the modern day living cats. And then one last thing before we go, uh, just to kind of recap what all of these, uh, what, what this specimen actually means. Uh, really, it tells us more about the morphology, about what this species would have looked like when it was living, but also it can tell us a little bit more about the ranges, right? Once something becomes preserved, that means it was there. It was there at some period in time. Uh, what's cool is when we pair it with that radiocarbon dating, when we say, oh, this specimen was roughly here 30,000 years ago. Um, this actually helps us understand the ancient distribution of these organisms as a whole. Uh, think about it, if you find five fossils from, you know, five different points of Asia, you could tell that, oh, hey, this group was maybe in the western half 30,000 years ago, but they were in the eastern half 50,000 years ago, right? So that's like some of the information we can gather from fossils. And in fact, here, uh, the discovery of the H. Latidens mummy in uh, Yokusha uh, radically expands the understanding of the distribution of the genus and confirms its presence in the late Pleistocene of Asia. So really, really cool study. Um, I wanted to cover it more in depth because it's such a really cool, well-preserved specimen. Um, and I'm hoping that this will really be used to make some fascinating studies, particularly around biogeography, which is more what I'm interested in. But uh, yeah, if you've watched till the end of this, Hi, hello, thank you for joining till the end. You're a G. Um, I just started filming videos again, so there's gonna be a lot more like this where we just cover a paper a little bit in depth, kind of break down a concept uh, more fully. But hey, I'm full time with this now. So if you wanna subscribe, that would be really useful. I'm getting back into the swings of things and uh, making more videos again. Very excited to be doing this and also happy to say that all of today I was filming a intro to phylogenetic trees course. Uh, so more courses will be coming soon. If you want to learn anything about that, just go to my website, learnadventurously, learnadv.com. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to stop this recording or else I'm going to tell myself that I need to re-record it again because I'm talking too much. But I don't want to do that to you. Have a wonderful day.